right, guys. Um, first of all, I want to do a couple of introductions of some people that are here tonight to, to join us, not the ones that are just going to be our speakers. I want to thank uh, City Councilor Linda Pereira. I want to thank uh, School Committeeman Tom Corey, uh, Kevin Spardella, the Assistant Director of the Housing Authority, uh, the new City Administrator Tim McCoy, uh, Caitlin, who's here from Senator Roderick's office. Um, we do have a few candidates that are also with us. Uh, Gabe Amaral, I believe he's a friend of mine, he's running for City Council, and I saw Ricky Tith here running for City Council. Um, there's a number of neighborhood association presidents with us. I know I'm going to forget some. I see Rob Ninkovich, obviously Mark Conrad from uh, our very own Corky Road Club where we are today, Natalie Mello from Bank Street. Uh, some of the people that I'm not introducing right now may be asked to come up and say a few words. We're going to ask everyone to be extremely brief. We'd like to end this thing by around 7.15, which would be fair to everyone, but the people that gave us the time are the ones we want to hear from mostly tonight are the residents. As you all know, Corky Road neighborhood in the city of Fall River took a significant hit last week with the tra tragic shooting of two young men right outside Griffin Park, one block from where we're holding this meeting. Before we truly begin this meeting, I want to yet again express my sympathy for the family, friends, and classmates of the victims. There is no place for violence and crime on any of our streets. As mayor, this incident was a reminder that we still have work to do to ensure that our neighborhoods are safe and our residents' needs are met. I also want to be clear. The Corky Row neighborhood has made tremendous progress in the last decade. Griffin Park has undergone significant renovations, houses are being rehabbed, and the neighborhood association has grown stronger and stronger. However, we can't overlook the issues in this area. This is why we're here today. With us today are national, state, and local safety authorities, along with key members from all city departments. I would like to take a moment to introduce some of those who are with us today, but since I already did that, we're going to go right into the people that are going to be able to say a few words tonight and before we get into the question part. And um, my first guest up tonight, who did an absolute <coughs> tremendous job on this case, along with um, our local police, our state police, uh, is our district attorney, Tom Quinn. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the safety and security of people uh, in Corky Row and throughout the county are a priority of mine. It's needless to say this is a very serious and tragic incident. Significant resources are being put into this case to investigate it and hold uh, anyone accountable who's involved in, uh, you know, this tragic, broad daylight uh, lawlessness that just simply can't be tolerated. So. We have a number of prosecutors on the case working well with uh, our state police detective unit, uh, along with Fargo Police Department, a very good relationship with them. So we're doing everything we can to uh, hold accountable uh, those involved in this case. So just ask you to hang in there, be patient, and hopefully uh, uh, justice will be done in this case. Thank you. Next up to say a few words is our um, Fargo Police Chief, Jeff Cardoza. He was here, he's been here every day since this hit, and uh, he's got some uh, great news for us, hopefully, going forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for having me uh, here at this very important meeting. Uh, if everyone could just bear with me, uh, there's a few things that I want to talk about before uh, we get into taking some questions. Quite frankly, this is the neighborhood's meeting, not my meeting, not the mayor's meeting, and I recognize that it's important that we listen to what your ideas, thoughts, um, concerns, and and I, you know, any type of uh, collaboration that you guys want to get involved in. So that's that's the most important thing for me tonight. Uh, before I talk a little bit more, I want to just mention some of the people that are here from my agency that are important to this neighborhood and important to me. Um, I have Captain Michael Dua, who's the commander of the major, uh, excuse me, the commander of the uniform division is on his way. We have uh, Sergeant Philandes, who runs the gang unit. I have uh, Sergeant Richard who is one of our <coughs> K-9 sergeants, uh, Lieutenant Murphy, who runs our Vice and Intelligence and Gang Unit, and a very important person in Corky Row, as Mark Conrad mentioned to me earlier, is Boss of Michael Hedaya. He's been working up in the Corky Row for several years now, so he's well known to everybody up here. Obviously, um, 
I am very pleased that we made an arrest in this particular incident, but what I am not pleased about is the surge in gun violence and shootings that we've had in Fall River. It's a, it's a very big concern to me. Um, and I want to just talk about that a little bit. Um, the shootings, as far as I'm concerned, one shooting in Fall River is, is one too many. And, you know, this has been a top priority of my administration since coming in. Gun violence in the community and it's going to continue to stay that way. <clears throat> The uh, Corky Row neighborhood, I've gone around the neighborhood since the shooting happened and talked to different people and they, quite frankly, they deserve better. We're going to do everything we can to, to make it better. Unfortunately, we've had 20 confirmed shootings in Fall River since the start of the year. As compared to years in the past, in 2019, we had 15 all year. And as compared to 2020, we had 20 all year. So this is a trend that I'm talking to a lot of different chiefs throughout the Commonwealth who are, um, have indicated to me that they're seeing you know, as many as 100, 200, and even 300 percent increases in shootings in their communities as well. So this isn't just specific to Four River. However, this Four River is what we care about. That's why we're here. I put up all the um, shootings in the community on a map. We often work with maps uh, in the building to put so, uh, cops on the dot, so to speak. Where the crime is, that's where we go. So there's a map over there. If anybody has any questions, each shooting is, is, uh, is numbered. If anybody has any questions about a specific shooting, please come up and ask me. Uh, I, you know, I've been briefed on all these shootings, and I'll certainly do the best I can to answer your questions. One of the things that the feedback that I got walking around the neighborhood the last week or so was that residents are asking about cameras. I think there's a perception that we don't have cameras up here. Uh, I'll tell you, I don't want to get into specifics, but I'll tell you that there are cameras all over this neighborhood. Our cameras, whether it's the mayor or the school department's cameras or our own funding that we've uh, taken out of our budget. There are cameras everywhere. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I talked to the mayor today, and um, I just signed a contract to purchase more cameras, including license plate readers. Uh, we're gonna have as many as 20 of them. Not all 20 are gonna come in this neighborhood. There's other neighborhoods that we gotta concern ourselves with. But we will be putting more cameras up in the Corky Row section. Uh, I wanna mention the group of cameras that you see at the entrance where the, the shootings took place, people have asked me about those cameras and it, it's, it's true that they're not working right now. That's something that we've been working on for the last three or four months. It's an infrastructure issue where we're trying to install some microwave dishes on top of some buildings and those should be up and running, I'm hoping, in the next month or so. So that'll be an additional set of cameras that's actually right inside the park. Officer Hedea, we, we've talked uh, today, he'll be working the Corky Row section, as I mentioned. He's going to be um, put on a bicycle. He's going to be uh, uh, going from foot patrol to bicycle patrol. And we're going to have other officers, you know, in the, uh, in the neighborhood as well, uh, in cruisers and on foot. One of the things that the mayor and I discussed doing when I became chief was treating shootings like homicides. Let's be quite frank, if somebody's shot in the leg, it might just be because the person doesn't know how to use a firearm and, or just happened to miss for whatever the circumstances are. So. What we do is, if there's a shooting that comes in at 3 o'clock in the morning and the person was shot in the foot, a team of detectives will come out and respond and work that just like we work a homicide. They're just as dangerous as someone who took someone's life. There may be a factor or circumstances behind why that person wasn't, did not die of a gunshot wound. So we're treating those like homicides. And I think that's an important thing. I've had some discussions with D.A. Quinn about it. And uh, we commit resources to our non-fatal shootings as well. We're going to continue to work with the DA's office. We uh, work with the FBI. I know Bill McDermott from the FBI is making his way here right now. He wanted to come and represent them. We uh, have a task force officer that works in the DEA. We're working very closely with the, the state police um, gang unit. I mentioned Bill McDermott. And um, he works on gang and gun crimes. Last week, I spoke with my counterparts in the state police and I asked for extra patrols uh, in the Corky Row and Flint neighborhood, uh, uniform patrols. I, I hope that you guys have seen them up here. They have a CAT team that's called the Community Action Team that uh, often comes out with extra resources. So hopefully that will sustain those re resources up here in the, in the Corky Row neighborhood over the summer. I just wanted to mention one other thing too. The, we had a lot of complaints last year uh, involving Rodman, Forth, and, and Hotwell Commons. And we had some significant success, I would call it, uh, whether it was making arrests for drug violations, uh, prostitution, or um, we also worked closely at, at the mayor 
had an idea to bring one of our drug addiction recovery coaches out with the offices into that area, and we had a lot of success. I fully recognize that with the warmer weather, that may stay start up again. So we're going to um, include that particular area in, in uh, the Corky Row uh, pro program that we're doing now. We've increased our minimum manpower from um, 10 cars to 12 cars, so we have extra offices on the street. That was a, at a significant cost to the community, but it was important, so the mayor and the council approved doing that. And one of the things I mentioned before when I was asked some questions by a reporter is sustainability. I, I know that everyone in this neighborhood, the good people are probably saying to themselves, well, we've seen this before, we're gonna have a couple of offices that are up here for three or four weeks and then they're gonna disappear. I am gonna do everything in my power and work with the mayor to make sure that we keep a decent and significant presence up here um, to, to make sure this doesn't happen again. I can't guarantee it, but we're gonna do everything that we can to um, sustain some a police presence up here. The flip side of that, and I always say this to folks, is that I need sustainability from the neighborhood folks, the neighborhood association. I need people to attend the meetings, and I need people to pick up the phone and call us. You can call the police and not leave your name. It's another thing that I've heard for the last two decades. Um, you know, I, why did, I saw this, Chief, I saw this. Did you call us? No, I didn't because I thought I had to leave my name. No, you don't have to leave your name. You can call. We'll take an anonymous call, and I promise you officers respond to anonymous calls. Some of our most significant cases um, have had a good ending because of anonymous information. So please, please call. If you see something, um, please call and let us know that we will, um, we will respond and, and do everything we can to put a case together. Finally, um, I've been talking with the mayor and several of the uh, councilors, as well as I had some conversation with some of the um, school committeemen. And uh, we can't do this alone, the police department. I think it takes a collaboration between the neighborhood, law enforcement, but the enforcement piece is just a part of that. I think that we have a place, it, the FRPD has a place in the education piece. So we've been having some discussions about working with our SRO program and perhaps bringing some type of educational piece into the schools or even during the summer where we can try and get to those uh, those folks that are that are younger perhaps considering getting involved in gun violence or um, yeah, uh, gang violence I'm gonna end it here um, I'm not sure if the mayor wants me to take questions or when he does but uh, we'll do that later okay I'm looking forward to your questions please if you have a question ask okay I do want to acknowledge someone else who joined us uh, City Council, Leo Palantir, uh, a few moments ago. Um, but the next person I'd like to come up and say is the state representative for this district, uh, Representative Alan Silver. Um, you know, uh, with all people who live in this neighborhood, would you just raise your hand? Uh, our police chief and our district attorney and of course our mayor but uh, the number of officers to hear the programs that are here the fire chief um, other city officials and of course uh, city councilors and neighborhood association folks because the most important thing and I want to tell you this is not a new phenomenon uh, in 1975 I actually walked the walking beat at Cocky Row 1975 now I want to tell you there's been vast improvements since then Incredible improvements, if you look at that park, if you look at property, you look at the improvements of, of, uh, of the property, as I said, in this, in this neighborhood, incredible improvements. However, it is also the most congested population of families in this five block area than in most areas of our community, of our, of our city. Uh, and uh, it really takes uh, and the mayor's alluded to this, and so hasn't the chief, but it's going to take people, when they see something, to call. To call the police station. To call 911. 6768511. Call, ask for communications. I see somebody that doesn't look, doesn't belong here. 
I see somebody dealing something at the corner. Because that's how we're going to ensure that police arrive here. Make it important. And, and, and so you're the eyes and ears. Because also what was mentioned is the uptick in gun violence. If you look at national news, you'll see that that's happening nationally. So if that's the trend, then we have to expect the possibilities of that. And hopefully, not the loss of life that we've seen, because as someone would say, well, that was an, a random act of violence. It wasn't a random life, it was a human life. And all life is sacred. And all of these folks, including the neighbors who live here, need to make, make it sacred. And the best way we can honor those people, that 14-year-old boy and others, is to call the police when you see something happening. And understand that everyone here is committed uh, to making this a safer community. My office is open every day. We don't close every day. Uh, we can be reached. If there's something we can do in the state level, I know Senator Rodericks' office is here. Uh, anything we can do, uh, we'll be there. Thanks. To our residents that are here, I do want to introduce a few people that are all that have also joined us. Um, we were going to let them talk, but I think that may start to impinge on how much time questions come it can come from the um, residents. Um, as I said, we have from the fire department, um, Chief Lynch does a great job. They were on the scene within two minutes of the first call, uh, and that's the kind of response we're looking forward to. And if I have to, and, and his guys for that kind of effort. Anybody here that's here to serve you can do better to make this a, a, a comfortable neighborhood and to support you any way, shape, and form. If you have a specific question, I'll make sure I direct you to the person that can help you with that question. And if I can't answer it, you can call my office tomorrow and you will get an answer. I assure you of that. Um, does anybody want to start this off with a couple of comments or questions? The young lady in the back. Uh, some people don't consider Some people don't consider The house I wanted to show you, the white one. The white one, yes, we did. Mark made sure he took me by that one on Saturday. The white, yeah, the big white. Yeah. He's the big one in the world. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because it's really bad out I walk my dog, I have a big pit bull, and I walk all over here. And this is better kept. Uh, it is not against the people that live there. But we are, there's a surge of a whole new bunch down there. And 
it's really bad. My son's lived there for over 25 years. Um, I've been there for five years, and I've seen it get worse. Well, I can tell you that when we walked through that property on Saturday morning, myself and Mike Dion and Mark Conrad, he made a, I made a point to take us to that piece of property. We will be contacting you on the owner of that property, hopefully with the program. That I am the, well, no, I'm, I live in the house. Oh, we want to talk to the owner, because we have some programs that can maybe turn that place around and not, not have it look like the way it is. It, it doesn't look bad. Yeah, they're, they're two different buildings. Doing oh, it. Hold on, I'm confused. Though. Yeah, it's just that, that's where the area where she lives <laughs> oh, is in the area. Which one is the one you showed us with the paint peeling? No, that near oh. that. Yeah. No, I don't live in the one. I, I know, right? I'm tell more exactly where you are. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm okay. confused. I think I live in the White House on the corner. Okay. I'm in the wrong house, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Mark, do you know which house she's speaking of? No, I don't know specifically. Okay. My house is at the corner of Third and Spring, directly across the street from the ab abandoned building. When I say abandoned building, I mean St. Mary's Elementary School. Right. Okay. They are using this, and I'm saying this right out, because I used to clean it myself. They have one person, a part-time person, that comes and cleans, okay? I did invite them to the next meeting. I hope that somebody from the representing the church will come. I took it upon myself to start cleaning up. They, it's ridiculous. Now they're using the steps as a toilet. We had to shut our hoses off outside because they were showering. That's what's going on over there. Uh, I've got a quick question. Is, that, is there a specific time? Is it all the time, day and night? Or day and night, whenever they get. Whenever they He's out like there a lot. I'm out there a lot. But everybody else works. Okay. And they almost like, I, I, I try to trick them because I really don't have anything to do during the day right now. <laughs> and I take off my car. I go around the block. And bam, they're right there. They're right there shooting up on the steps of my house in front of a blessed bridge. And I mean, maybe that doesn't mean anything to anybody. But it means something to me. Okay. It's yeah. disrespectful. That's bothering me more than them doing the drugs. <laughs> you know the house? I do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else want yeah, to add something? I have one. Okay, go ahead. I've been seeing some, uh, they, you guys have an excellent job on 4th and Rodman Street. But the crowd from 4th and Rodman are in our neighborhood now on okay. Spring and 3rd. They've taken over like the steps of St. Mary's School. In her bushes, I find crack and everything else. In my yard, I have found needles thrown over the fence. So it sounds like we, I know we've been targeting the Rodman Street. You're, you're right, suggesting exactly. that maybe we, they've moved. Exactly. They've moved. It's the same group that was on Rodman and Forth that are now in our neighborhood. Okay. Okay. And they're constantly there. And I think we all know in this room that that can happen, and we, we need to know. So this is good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll follow them. Anybody else have anything? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, and then, then we'll go to you. This I'm young sorry. lady right here. I just have to say, like, um, what happens when I see, I've talked to a lot of peace officers since the whole 4th Street thing happened. It's the, um, I talked to a lot of officers, your office, I just even spoke to you. More on foot, I think, that women need. Like, in the cars, like, I'm from the hood. Like, I'm from the hood. Like, once your car leaves, we're going to go right back. You know what I mean? You, you got to be on foot. You Maybe, like, I don't know, maybe not just like that. Like, more foot, more interacting with the community, something like that. Because, like, all you're going to do is, all right, so now they're complaining about their area. All right, so then now they're going to move from another area. It's just going to keep on bouncing. I know you guys can't clean up the streets. It's, like, impossible. There's going to be bad and good everywhere. But I feel as though maybe more on foot, more... Like, how me and you were talking the other day, like, more on foot. Like, not so much in the cars. Like... Because the ones in the cars, I don't know, last couple of days they've been like, they don't talk. Like all the rest of the people that I talk to, they're like really friendly. But like the ones in the cars, they just sit in the car. Yeah. More like surveillance. If they're walking, they can walk to thirds right there. They can walk to fourth. You know what I mean? Like I don't know how much they can do, but like. So let me talk about that a little bit. Some of, the, some of the officers that you're seeing now are in like a specialized unit. So they have, they have, they have some discretionary time to, um, you know, do some foot patrols or. You know, you could see an officer that's like, uh, we call over a covert. Covert might be a plain clothes roll walking around or, or just over it, whether it's on the bike, like off in a day or walking on a foot patrol. Some of the cars that you see, the mock cars are uniform cars and they are, are responding to calls. Okay. Not all the time, don't get me wrong, is there are times that they have downtime and that's why I have Captain Duart here who uh, oversees that. That's the largest division in the building. And we're encouraging those officers. That's I believe that door to the cruiser is a barrier, and we're not going to create relationships or make a difference unless you 
remove that barrier. So what I want his officers to do is to, when they have downtime, they have my permission. They can park the car, get out of the car, walk, interact with the folks in the neighborhood. Now, if there's an emergency call and they're not close to their car, somebody else can go to that call that's in the car. Or if they're close to their car, they can still take that call and respond in a timely fashion. But that door, absolutely, and, and, and Representative Silver mentioned it, you know, we used to have so many walking beats years ago. And, and that, you know, an officer on foot is just, I, everyone I've talked to in my 30 year career has always said the same thing. An officer on foot makes them feel good. We talked about this the other day in the park. It makes it feel good. You feel like you approach them in the car, you don't feel like you're Yeah. I plan on having my lunch in the park, and not just this park. Um, you know, I'm going to have some, I'm going to take, I'm going to pick up a lunch, and, and if the weather's good, I'm going to go to Wamsada well, Playground, some of the other parks as well. Because um, you get to meet people and hear um, what's going on in the neighborhood, and that's what I want for these guys as well. Hey, Hold on just one second. We, we told that young lady she could go next, then you, then you next. Go ahead. cell phones so then they then they tell them to meet them over here up the street around the park you know what I mean it's okay. that's how they how they're doing it you follow those panhandlers yeah. and the prostitutes you will find the drug dealers Mayor? so I do just want to say thank you I see that there's lots of extra patrols out here since the incident happened. Um, however, on my way here today, I see two cop cars sitting outside of Vic's car wash. Not, nobody's out of the cars. In, they're they're, not, they're not communicating with, with the neighborhood. They're just sitting there being intimidating mm -hmm. instead of being kind of welcoming and friendly. Okay, so that's just one thing. Maybe they should get out and kind of communicate a little bit. Also, what I'm hearing is kind of like short-term solutions to a long-term issue, okay? This is a systemic issue. So I'd like to see what we're gonna do 
for funding for these children after school, mentoring, yes. something. Preach. Because we need to get them off the streets and into something positive so that it doesn't turn into this. Yes, I agree 100%. I, will, I, will I raised my children 12 years <coughs> right next to that park. And luckily, because I kept my kids very active in after school activities, and I went without sometimes to make sure that they had those after school activities. But I did that so that they would not end up out here with nowhere else to turn. Like, because the, these kids that were hap that they involved in this incident, I know them personally. I've seen them grow up. So it's, it's very saddening. It's, it's unsettling. Yeah. But I can tell you what's going to happen this summer in Fall River compared to the last few. Uh, this year, because of the, the disease, we have a significant infusion of money in the city. We're going to be able to go back to um, hiring a bunch of kids. I'm hearing there's going to be two, 250 jobs for kids to work in the parks, helping clean the streets, do art programs, get involved with sports. We haven't had that in a long time. Last year, I believe there was 50 or 60 kids working. So we're going to get an infusion of money there. After school programs, I talked about them briefly. Let's have an art class right here. Why can't we have a homework club right here in this neighborhood? We need kids doing positive things. If uh, Bobby gets his sports league going, we're going to have four divisions, under 10, 10 to 14, 14 to 17, and even an adult league so the kids get out and play basketball and do something positive. And I believe we'll still be feeding kids in the park all summer. So there is going to be some positive things going on. This, this young lady is, is 150 billion percent correct. For too long, some of these kids have been allowed to just slide, and they need, they need structure, and they need people to care for them. They need people to care for them. I don't need someone walking by, and I don't need someone ignoring them. We need someone talking to them. We need people reaching out to them. It's, my experience in schools tell me that's the only way it'll work, and God knows I've fought with more kids than anybody in the city probably. I see a few of them here, but I never disrespected them. I never disrespected them. And as long as you talk to them and tell them what your expectations are, they'll come around. We have a great opportunity right now in Fall River because of COVID funding to make this place better for everyone to live. And that's my goal. And that's all I'm going to work on is how do we make Fall River better? And I know it's on the ground. Like I said, when we were walking around Saturday, I was looking at things for a few hours down here. And then uh, we went down to... Uh, Wamsutta Park or the Kathy Asad Tot Lot to walk along Pleasant Street. We're going to put our feet back on the ground so we see firsthand for ourselves, and um, that's what we need to do in Fall River. Uh, Rena, you had a question, and then that young lady that spoke first. Is there going to be some kind of coordinated effort to share information, um, you know, between housing and the ins building inspectors and the information the police glean? Because, you know, I've got clients that are business owners here in Corky Row that they rent, the landlords are absent. They're, they're not owner-occupied properties, and, and more often than not, that's the location that a lot of things happen. Or these non-owner-occupied tenements where great tenants live and stuff goes on there mm -hmm. because these owners that don't live in Fall River don't care. Don't care. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, these great tenants are asking for repairs. There's building violation, health code violations. And, you know, the information that, you know, four people got busted in that parking lot is not shared with housing. Because I can tell you that these non-owner occupied owners, when they start getting letters and fines from the building inspector, or they start getting uh, letters from the city, from corporate council saying clean it up or get out, that they may clean up these properties and put no trespass signs and put cameras on their properties mm -hmm. and start ensuring the safety of their residents. I have two clients that are property owners in Corky Row, pristine apartment houses, six tenements. The people that live there pay their rent, they feel safe, the properties are well taken care of because they're owner occupied. It, you know, I just find that there's a lack of sharing of information. Our guys in blue get great information. And more often than not, the residents living in these non-owner occupied houses have things happening right in their driveways and they're powerless to do anything about it because these owners that don't live here 
don't care. Yes. They don't care about Parky Rock. Right. They don't care about this lady. They don't care about that lady. They're they collecting their, their money. money. Yep. They're getting federal money for these subsidized apartments with great yep. tenants, and there's no sharing of information. Is there going to be an effort to do that more? Yes. yes. Like what we should be doing right along. Right. Um, I know that uh, Kevin's here from the Housing Authority. They own a significant number of units here. Um, again, they, you, anybody that has a question about them, they can talk to Kevin after the meeting. Uh, Glenn, in the blue, his office takes complaints about property all day long. Glenn, am I right or wrong? Yes, we do. Yes, and I can assure you that the police department notifies me on a regular basis. Nice. Okay? We haven't been in the Corky Road much lately because there's been lack of there. But as far as that young lady talking and uh, all the complaints that were happening on the corner of 4th and Rodman, uh, I was calling the police myself, okay? The, the, the house behind the, the store there was a major contributor to that. So we're, all, we're on top of it with the help of the police. They help me and I help them. Yeah, but just uh, regarding the housing authority property, we have housing officers that they actually fund, and I know there's a fantastic relationship in between. I want to talk specifically about the housing authority properties where if there's an issue, whether it's with a tenant or whoever it is, and it's you know, a property issue, they're letting those guys, those folks know the housing authority It's been pretty good. COVID might have impacted it a little bit. So we used to do uh, um, some, some stop and knock and drops. Uh, those are kind of fell by the wayside, but hopefully they'll be picking up in the next few weeks. Thank you. Bobby Bailey in the back. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I just spoke Bobby Bailey. <coughs> for a second. Yeah. Um, regarding this gentleman with the, the panhandlers, yeah. isn't there a law against, it might be blue law, but you can drag these guys with vagrancy and panhandling. Yeah. If they're a drug addict, they're going to have some kind of uh, paraphernalia. No. So we were, we, uh, the, the city was, uh, you know, at least a lot of research. Say that again? The city, this, this police department was, the ACLU, um, we were enforcing that. There is, there is a law about stepping into the street. There, we also have an ordinance about hand handling, and um, you know, some some folks were charged. Some of those folks were charged, and uh, not last summer, but the summer before. And the ACLU sued us for lack of a better expression, and uh, we lost. So um, the courts have made a decision that that is a, a protected right. Just in every moment, everywhere. But chief, can I add to that? Isn't there a way to limit the time that a person can handle? In other words, you're letting them do it, but it's between certain hours because most of the time they're at highly traveled intersections. And if we were to pass some kind of a law that they could handle. The ACLU says you can, they can, but that it's between these hours or that you got to get a permit and you can only do it twice a year okay, to collect in the street. Is there something else? Maybe that's something we could look into. I'm not familiar with that, but we certainly could you know, talk about that. Well, maybe council. we should have I, a I don't, I don't think so, Council. I think it's pretty, I think it's a bright line rule that they can do that, um, but I'm not an attorney and we can certainly do some research on that. Right? Okay. I think what, uh, I have kids, right, we got a couple of hands. Bobby, then Dawn, then this young lady. Leo Smith's here. Oh, no, I just, I just wanted to say, uh, first off, when I heard about the situation that happened the other day, I was completely disgusted. Um, just because, for one, I feel like there's so many kids killing kids, right? Um, you know, when we look at the age groups of the shootings and things that are going on around here. But also, uh, one thing that I stand firm with is the saying that it takes a village, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think a question we also need to ask and remain solution-oriented, because I think we're hyper-focused on what the, what the police can do, um, but also as communities, I think we have to come together and really figure out what the solution is, right? Because, you know, we're stand I'm standing in the Corky Row area right now, um, and everyone's saying they need more beat police, more police walking, more police. But, you know, these are kids. At what point do they turn into murderers or victims? Um, so I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves, even when we're talking about creating programming and events and things of that nature. How do we um, solve the real issue, right? Um, development and making sure that these kids 
are in the right places, or if you see kids <coughs> outside playing, you catch them, you know, at 10 years old instead of catching them at 18 or 24 when it's too late. Um, Come on, buddy. And I think I think that's the biggest issue that we do have. Um, you know, so as I stand up here, um, you know, and I start even thinking of my development. Yeah, I had programming and things like that, but I also had people who I see in the crowd who supported me, um, good or bad. Um, you know, and encouraged me. Um, no matter what I was doing, and kept me on a straight path. Um, you know, so when we look, not even just talking about programming, um, I think as I'm listening to everyone speak, we're relying heavily on policing. And it can't just be policing that is solving these issues. So um, I think sharing of information is very important. There's applications where we can do that at. Um, but the issue is, is I think there's a divide, um, whether we like to do it or not, whether it's neighborhoods, um, whether it's socioeconomics, whether it's color, creed. Um, so until we fix those issues, it's going to be very tough, and we're going to be just relying on policing. Um, I think there definitely needs to be more meetings and things of that nature. And I've had great dialogue with the mayor and also uh, the chief and my boss, Mike Dion, on some things that we can do. Um, I'm happy to give my email, share, and get together, but we really need to start getting out um, at the community and really start solving this as well. Um, and that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. So, back in 2013, the Lanigan administration, they took possession of a couple houses here in the city. Um, for unruly tenants, dangerous drug dealing, unpaid taxes, etc. I'm just wondering, is the city of Fall River planning or thinking about the possibility of implementing the same plan that the Flanagan administration did back in 2013? Hi, my name is Mike Dion. I'm the Director of Community Development for the City. And you're exactly 100% right. Um, under uh, Mayor Coogan, we've brought back the Building Blocks program because it worked. Okay? Works very well. So, through our walkthrough on Saturday, um, I have pictures all over my phone on different properties um, that need to be looked at. My office works with the Attorney General's office for the receivership program, so we'll take mm -hmm. the house from the landlord. Uh, the mayor and I also spoke at length about instituting some type of code enforcement uh, uh, inspection process throughout Corky Row so that we can look at people who are not keeping their yards clean, who are not take, keeping up their properties. We have at CDA many programs for people to improve their houses in terms of grant funding, low interest loans, um, we'll do anything. Uh, my office is the one that redid Griffin Park. Um, my office has done a lot of properties throughout this area. Uh, you know, Mark takes a lot of pride, and so do I in the Corky Row. Um, so yes, we're gonna, we are bringing it back. Today, it's not in this neighborhood, but we tore down a property at uh, Fountain Street, and we got two more on Wednesday, one on Henry Street, one on Lawton Street. So the landlords, yes, beware, because we're coming for the houses that are not being kept up. Um, we're going to start looking at those landlords. But we, I also need your help, because I don't know what houses are vacant. Um, you walk through the city, and people still have blinds in them. What we thought one was vacant, I rang the doorbell, and people came out. Um, so I need a little bit of help from the neighborhood to let me know what are the problem properties, what are the nuisance properties. We have a meeting next week where we're going to be identifying the ten top nuisance properties in the city like we've done five or six years ago, okay? And we're going to start looking at those properties to, to, to shut them down because the, the, the community, it takes only one bad house. And as we walk through the neighborhood, the houses in Corky Row are really nice. Mm. There's yeah. a lot of yeah. property owners that take pride in their property. And I, somebody brought it up, and it's true. I think we need to stop finding people, because if there are outside landlords that are not keeping their property up to snuff, when you get a $300 ticket, and then you get another $300 ticket, you stop taking notice. So there are a lot of good programs that are going to be coming forward. The mayor and I spoke. Saturday about doing a community center in this neighborhood and we're talking about maybe the Corky Road Club somehow 
maybe we can get our recreation department to come down on a certain number of days during the week, open up a community center so people can take pride, kids can start learning, doing activities. We talked about bringing back movie nights in the park, so we're going to be doing a movie night over here at Griffin Park. Um, you know, COVID did affect us a little bit, but, and I'm not using that as an excuse, but there's a lot of good ideas that we have, and we're going to start instituting them one by one to make a difference. So. Anybody can call Community Development. We're on the sixth floor of Government Center. Call us. We'll help you with whatever we can help you with, okay? Especially for housing. So if you have a property here and you need some support, don't be afraid to call. Um, this young lady right here. I've been in this area for over 35 years. This is the worst. I'm here to talk a little bit. I'm sorry. They can't hear you. I'm sorry. I've lived in this area for over 35 years. This is the worst it's ever been. What I seem to realize is that park area, because those kids don't believe those cameras are working. They just think they're oblivious, and they just continue to do what they do. And you got the older ones using the younger ones. Yeah. And the sad part is, we need more active cameras in that whole area, because that will deter them from being around. Yeah. So I don't know if you heard earlier, but uh, that particular set of cameras has been in for some time. It's true that they're not working. I know that sure. They're going to be up and running shortly. That was an infrastructure issue. But we do have cameras up, our own cameras, um, more than you realize. And, and we're going to be putting additional ones up as well as what's called license plate readers. So, um, you know, we're going, to, we're going to try to surround the neighborhood with as much surveillance as we can. Because let's face it, folks, that helps us solve these cases. So. Yep. Well, please call. Please, you know, again, I just want to emphasize that. Please call us, even for these quality of life issues. I heard some folks say to me, well, I didn't want to call you for the loud stereo because, you know, you guys are busy. We're not that busy. Um, we'll get to it. It may, it may end up being a lower priority call, but we're, we're a, we're a service-oriented police department. We're going to stay in that way, so please call us. I'm sorry, I, uh, Leo, then Sean, um, City Council, and then this gentleman in the back. So we're going to go one, two, three. Go ahead, Leo, yeah, please. Okay, uh, question for the Chief. Yes, sir. Uh, I noticed around town, you got a bunch of kids that go to the mall, for the mall. We park there where Friendly's is. And you got 30 people there, and they got their cars. It is private property. But they're just there talking and doing what they want to do. Uh, what is your, how do you handle this pertaining to that or any other place on corners? Do you guys disperse them? I know many, many years ago when I was a little kid, I got dispersed. That's why I done all right when I grew up. But what do you guys do? If they go by and you see a group, do you disperse them? It depends. It really does. I mean, we just, um, you know, People have rights, as you know, and we're, you know, we're, uh, I encourage the uh, officers that work for me to make sure that the most important thing is to not violate anyone's constitutional rights. But if there's a loud radio involved, if there's litter involved, if they're on private property, uh, you know, I, I want those things addressed. You talked about, I remember uh, down in the South End for many years, down at the Friendlies area where Harbor Freight is, there were issues down there with, with cars racing in the parking lot and litter and and then I, I forget who the owner was, but they ended up agreeing to be a, a complainant for the trespass, no trespass. So the, the, the kids were in there, if we had to, we took the ultimate action of actually placing them under arrest or citing them with the trespass by motor vehicle. So, um, you know, as far as kids on the corner, I mean, you know, I, you know I've, been for a long, I've been on for a long time. We, we disperse kids, but it, it, it all depends. I would encourage the office to encounter them by an encounter and say, hey, what, what, what's going on, guys? What are you up to? What's, you know, not necessarily say scram, because uh, they might they might be doing nothing wrong. Nice. Right, but they're still there. But that's what I want to know. And that's the exact spot what I was talking about. And today, uh, in my tours today, I called in three nuisance properties, but two of them I already called in a year ago, and we had knocked one down uh, last year. I pursued that one for five years. Five years. I mean, 
And we got ordinances, but we can't enforce them. How can we enforce all the ordinances? I don't know. You've got to answer that. We had a such bad time last year with fireworks. It's crazy. 2 o'clock in the morning, 2.30, I call. Everybody's calling. Nothing got done. Are we going to have a better year this year? People shouldn't have to listen to that stuff. Yeah. So the fireworks was, it was absolutely With that, that's hundreds, enough for me. hundreds of calls. And, and we're certainly going to do everything we can to uh, to enforce it. If we catch someone with fireworks, we're going to enforce it. We're going to obviously seize it and charge it. Uh, but there were a lot of times where, you know, they're, they're, they're shooting off fireworks in the middle of the roadway council and then they're leaving. You know, and then and then the cruisers get there. Every day, I was, it was at a point where I was getting briefed every day on the fireworks calls the night before and what officers, what action officers took and didn't take and why. Uh, so I'm really concerned about the fireworks this year and I'm, I'm hoping it's not a repeat of last year. But for whatever reason, uh, it's like the shootings. It, they're just, it's, it's, I'm hearing it from chiefs all over the Commonwealth. Uh, they, you know, there's, there's some police departments that uh, have a population of 40,000 people and they've had eight, between 18 and 25 shootings in two months. So uh, it's, it's, it's across the board. Uh, Sean, 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 Sean. Oh, okay. So picking back up, Bob. It was a tragedy to see that this kid, 14 years old, that got shot, and then the other kid. And I personally knew um, one of the kids that actually died, right? And like I knew his brother and come up with his family around here. I'm no politician or anything else. I'm just a kid that grew up in the river and learned how to sink or swim real quick, mm -hmm. right? And at five years old, I got here. I played ball through Durfee and everything else. So. I've been a, been a mentor, worked with adolescents on all different levels, from YMCA to the Boy Scout, Wilkner Housing Project, <coughs> here Hillside, made up before I uh, followed the ferry old. I learned my way to survive through the city, right? And to be able to sit back and look at it now, and I'm 42, and, and see where this park, where this park's always been a problem. Like, I heard a lady say that if this is the worst it's ever been, this ain't the worst it's ever been. I've been around here long enough to know when, 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 um, Back in the Boston days, like when those kids came around, those Columbia Street kids, not Columbia Street, Columbia Ave kids came by in 2006. Like they had this Wade, Fifth, Morgan, like I ended up fighting a whole bunch of kids because out of town people came in and it was like, it was a rival between the two. Cops, listen, the cops are gonna do what they can for the best that they can for, for, for the most part. Do you can't really just keep somebody locked in and then try to isolate everything and keep it like under siege and try to keep everybody safe. You can only do the most cops, like I, like, I take my hat off to you because all you guys can only do so much. You can't worry about somebody sitting there talking about fireworks and somebody else is selling like 40, 50 bags of heroin in the next street over. There's only so much that you can do in this city. For the most part, I'm with Bobby. Right? Like, I was Bobby's coach for multiple years and ended up, he ended up going, doing great in his basketball career in Durfee and everything else. Programs. Get these kids early. 9, 10, 12, 13. I mean, from 12? 12 to 17. Where do we go? I'm talking about hope. I'm talking about hope. And I don't need to do no degree to express, express how I feel. Right? Hold on. Pay an edge off. How can other people evolve? Now you talk about the city wants to evolve. We all want to evolve. We all want to get to a place of security. We all want to get to a place of success. And we all want to feel safe in my city, right? So how do I feel safe in my city outside of cops? I need programs that are insured in different programs, whether it be Rowcliffe or Rolling Green. I don't care, from the Highlands to Hillside, which is now Father DeFerrio. Wherever it may be, we need people that's going to be able to care about the kids Care about the youth, because from 13 to 17, there's nowhere to go. And with social media, it ain't like when I came up, when they had that MySpace or just beepers, we were running off of beepers. Today, these kids are trying to feel as if they're known, and the music plays a role, right? If there's nowhere a kid can go besides a basketball program, a soccer program, or something else, and if his parents can afford it, I'm going to talk about it. If his parents can't afford it, because my grandmother raised me here. She was on welfare for multiple years. She died years ago, and I continued my life, right? And I don't live in this, in this area. Like, I live way up past, like, um, Cumberland Farms in a nice, you know, house, whatever else the case may be. But I built something. But I'd never forget where I came from. And that's just the bottom line. That's the only reason why I'm here, because I'm scrolling through my Facebook. 
I happen to see, and I wanted to sit, I wanted to sit and see how many people of color were sitting in this room. Let's get honest. Because a lot of people in this city are now not only Portuguese immigrants, not only Irish, we got people from all different areas coming and we don't even know their last name. And we're trying to give the parents a sense of hope because the rent is so low here that the low income property people that own these houses don't know about who lives there, they want their money. Mm -hmm. We all trying to get by. We all trying to eat, bro. I need my cash. You understand? And with that being said, sometimes the responsibility of being that, like, like uh, being that landlord and taking care of the properties isn't always uh, permittable or up to cold, so to speak, right? I get that. We're all just trying to survive. I think if you work with the, the police, not only have your, your Brooklyn Park Day that you have, because like, I didn't know you got a Brooklyn Park Day, like getting into like Highland, Kennedy, getting into Rowcliffe, getting into Ruggles, getting into Maple Garden, getting into different heritage types, getting into different places where these kids see hope, where they see people like them. When I came up, I only seen a select of people like me. I was somebody for Bobby and many other people in the city. Jamal Johnson, I can name a few. But there was other people like Mike Herring that He's not here now, but he was somebody that I looked up to, Chrissy, and a bunch of those guys, because they loved the sport that I loved to play, and they gave me hope that kept me off the street. That kept me from selling the three for tens at that time. And I know, you know, Jeff understands what I'm talking about. I'm not here to blow gas up people. I'm here to tell you what these streets are. I've been on both sides of this river, and I was still able to survive. People need to really pay attention to our youth, because if you don't, this summer is going to be a cold summer. And I don't know if anybody understands what I mean by a cold summer. But we just had a couple of bodies, and they cold. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, touch on Sean, Bobby, and this woman up front. Um, I grew up in this neighborhood. Uh, my family immigrated here and they've been in the same house on 5th Street where all the shell casings were littered in our driveway. Um, I grew up there, I've been in and out, up and down the street. Ten years old, I joined the gang living in this neighborhood. Twelve years old, I was selling drugs on a street in this neighborhood. Um, What they're saying is true. You gotta get you gotta get the kids around those ages. I got seven years that I haven't been arrested. Seven years without using any type of drugs. But when I see when I see stuff like this still going on, I grew up in the 90s where gangster rap was a thing and it was a lot worse out here. And everybody was in the gang went to Durfee and everybody had a bandana of pink, yellow, blue, green, red. Everybody was a gang member. That's what this city was about because of music, like Sean was saying. But uh, it's mainly because, no offense to anybody above 40, 45 in here, uh, the, uh, the, old, the older crowd might, you guys just don't understand because you're from a different era. We grew up late 80s, 90s music. That shit is, is, is out there. Um, we try to live it. Um, so without guidance, um, you know, we, 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 we bring it into the street, into the community, and things happen like what, what happened. So, um, like, I'm not proud of it. I've allegedly used weapons on these streets. I've allegedly sold to people right in front of my grandmother's house. Um, I'm not proud of that. So, like what these guys are saying, the only, no offense, I mean, besides this, this woman here, policing, policing is only a little bit because when you guys were out here in um, the early 2000s, you put up a camera, you had a substation, I just went the next street over and made money. So, it, that's, that's only going to do so much, guys, and, you know, um, I don't know what to say, but that, I appreciate what you guys are doing. I do think... You guys should be out here. Like I heard another person saying that you would just sit, they see him sitting in the car. Get out the car, park the car. I like how you park the car at uh, Mr. Chicken or wherever that is on the corner of Rodman. 
You got a car park there to stop all that. Robin and um, Fourth. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like that. Okay. But get 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 the guys out of the car, talking talking to people oh, yeah, because I, I drove by the, the very next day. I wanted to see what you guys because I watched you on the news, Mr. Mayor. I watched uh, Cardoza. And you said, we're going to do something, we're going to be out here. And the very next day, I drove by, and you had four cops at the entrance of the park. Right across the street, you had four, four homies just like, it's a joke to them. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's like 10% of the, of, the, of the way we're going to fix this city. I think your key word was without guidance. Without guidance. They need guidance. Yes. The my, needs guidance. My, 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 that's 10%, OK? The, the other 80%. And ten something else, but eighty percent is the guidance. Okay, I heard that there's going to be a program. Bobby's going to run a basketball program. There should be free basketball programs for all these kids. They should be able to sign and play basketball in this park. It should be free. Maybe a skate park in that corner with all the grass to get other kids involved in things that maybe you know. If you go on the West Coast, I, I, you know, black, Spanish, they skateboard. Out here, there's not that many kids doing that. You put it in the park, they might do it. You know, they, I, I guarantee they'll do it. That should be done. Basketball should be done. I don't know who runs the Fall River Falcons, but if it's the Fall River Falcons, okay, well, I didn't know, I didn't know my boy who ran it. When I, when I coached the Falcons for a few years, my, my kid, I played, my kids played ball. I coached, and there was a program with uh, uh, food stamps and welfare where kids could get in. I don't know if they still do that. They still but do. We do scholarships. They still do. Every year we do a certain years. number. And we, I we didn't know. see that. We have families donate all the time. Okay. So there's plenty of room out there. Paying for, paying for it is never going to be the issue in the, in the city. Okay. There's enough people out there. There's plenty of generous people out here in the city that aren't the struggling families that will help. And you can see it online. It's been going and trending right now. People are out there wanting to donate. I want to help one kid. I want to help two kids. I want to play with the Fall Falcons. I'm actually, I, thank God I have a support system there and I have people coaching right now. We have practice right now and I'm here because, again, how do I keep my kids safe there if I can't even get them there? We have to figure it out. I have to pick and choose which kids I want to save today. That's a problem. I appreciate what you're trying to do in the, in the neighborhood. Make, make, make a rec center, or one of the other guys said a rec center in this neighborhood. This neighborhood is congested. You got to get the kids from 10 to 13 because when I, some of the kids I've coached, I see them now, and 9 out of 10 of those kids are doing the right thing. Okay? And that's because they, had, they don't have a father figure, but they had somebody in their life early, and I communicate with them on Facebook now. I got these kids, they're 23, 24 years old, and they call me coach, and it's like, it's kind of funny, but you know, it, it, it feels good that they're doing good, you know? So I'm gonna end, I said a lot, you know, I rambled, but the kids need to be, everything you guys are doing, great, 10%. The kids is what needs to be done, and so my question as I end, I hear you, Mr. Mayor, saying you, you're gonna do this, do this, do this, do this. Bobby's got this going on. I just want to know when. when. That's it. I want to know when. More, more Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you very much for everybody for coming out. My name is Mark Conrad. I'm the president of the Corker Road Neighborhood Association. I've been involved with the association for a little over five years now, and uh, I just can't thank you enough for caring so much for us that you'd come out on a beautiful day like today and uh, be a part of this. Can I, um, can I tell you what has been going on? All right. Um, so the Neighborhood Association, first of all, I'd like to do a commercial. It meets right here at the Corky Row Club, the first Monday of every month at 6.30. All y'all are invited. Feel free to come anytime. Don't feel as though you have to come every time. Because I've got very good people here who work in this community who can't make these meetings. Then I've got people here who are at every single meeting. So let me tell you who comes, and I can guarantee you who will be here at these meetings. First of all is the Corky Row Club, and all the folks from the Vets Kitchen, they're over here. They'll be here. <coughs> the Mayor's Office will be here. Elena will be here. All right. Sergeant Richard is our new sergeant, uh, Officer Hadiah. They will be here. I've got key people I can see in the room. They will be here. They have been for years. We have a very active schedule. 
We start off with as many activities, and they focus, Bobby, entirely on the youth of this, uh, this community. We have uh, done wonderful things. We, we do this Wednesday night youth program all summer long. We try to start have a, a vacation Bible school, but we've lost both churches. They closed. We do uh, a community day, which unfortunately due to COVID, we can't do, at least these last few years, because of, of the disease. Well, we have 100 people in that park. Hamburgers, hot dogs, a three-on-three men's basketball tournament with cash prize. I, I can keep going. Our Christmas parties. We did our first Christmas party here for the children two years ago. Couldn't do it last year because of it. These activities go on all the time. What we desperately need are volunteers. We, we don't have them. Uh, the young lady's kind of hiding it, but, but she's our secretary, and she's applied for our 501c3. Once that goes through, things will change as well. Please don't let what I'm about to say change anything about my gratitude towards you. How many of you will I see at the meeting in two weeks? Oh, thanks, Tati, but you're, you're online with me. Of course you're from here. Of course. I, feel free. Look, I guarantee you, the first thing that happens on the agenda, the very first thing that happens is our police officers tell us about activity in this community. And then they take our feedback. And this whole thing the chief was talking about down on Rodman, I, I'm certain Officer Hideo was way ahead of us, but that was our big complaint. That was our big complaint. And it, and it was resolved. And, and then again, in a way that's very positive, community policing, working with these poor folks who I feed and clothe every month, working with them, the, the counselor, it was such a great idea, not treating them like criminals, <laughs> people who are suffering from homelessness and drug addiction and alcoholism. Those things are happening. We are doing it. I, I want to I agree also with Bobby and say that. I, I know our police are going to come through for us. They always have. And they'll do it self sacrificially <laughs> But we the residents of Corky Row and our friends, and we have many of them, including my fellow residents, all right, have poured themselves into this community. And it made the difference. But we just need to go further and continue to make it. Thank you, Mark. I also want to introduce someone that's here before I turn it over to uh, Joe. Uh, Christian McCluskey is a youth coordinator for the city. He gets involved with a ton of programs to help kids, and he'll be an active participant in what we're going to try to do this summer. This summer. Joe DeCruz in the back corner. How you guys doing? My name's Joe DeCruz. I'm nobody important. I work with uh, Christian McCluskey for our youth service programs here in the city of Fall River. Uh, we work with the Shannon uh, SSY <coughs> and GBP programs. Uh, it's all preventative and intervention based. Uh, programs. The woman up front said it perfectly. Uh, you know, she's she's a resident here in the city. She's had to claw tooth and nail to provide services to her kids. Uh, we have a program. It's right at 45 Rock Street. If anyone's interested, feel free to pull me aside after the meeting. I'll give you my personal number, email. I'll give you the office number. Um, it's all uh, grant-funded programs that work with youth from the ages of 11 all the way up to young adults and, and older adults up to the age of 27. Uh, we provide educational services, employment services, pro-social activities, um, and counseling services as well. So we're located at 45 Rock Street. I oversee the program with Mr. McCluskey. I also worked with uh, uh, Mr. Corey over the years as well. Grew up in the same neighborhoods as Bobby. Grew up in the same neighborhoods as Nelson. Grew up in the same neighborhoods as Boomer. Um, it's, it's a dire need. We have to pay attention to the youth. We have to catch them, like Sean said before we left. You have to catch them at a young age. It's not much you can do once they're 16, 17, and 18 years old. You gotta catch them young. When I pulled up, I was actually parked on the wrong side of the park because I didn't know we were meeting in here. But it was beautiful to see. We just had this, this tragic event that happened last week. And to pull up and you see kids, it's a beautiful thing to see the kids in the community playing in the park after such a tragic event. You know, so it's not fair. Like we talk about all the other you know, issues that we're having in the neighborhoods and such. But we have to worry about the kids. We have to worry about the youth because they're our future. They don't understand all the stuff about properties and all this other stuff. They just need someplace safe to go. They need someone important that, that's going to care about them, that's going to sit there and listen. You know, I know the police, they do a great job. I was on a, a conference call earlier today, a Zoom meeting earlier today with the sergeant. Um, so they're doing the best they can as well, but it's going to take a community, like Bobby said, to get everyone on the same page to, to, to understand that the youth are what's important in the community. Um, so again, if anybody needs my information after we leave, you can pull me aside. 
I'll give you my personal office email, whatever you guys need. <coughs> Thank you. So my name is Nelson. I grew up here in on Fifth Street. Unlike probably nobody here, I'm probably like involved with like everything that's probably ever happened here for like the last 15 years. So I'm pretty much was in the center of all that stuff. I have friends who've done crazy things. I have friends who died from doing drugs, turned addicts. And that was my friend who passed away, a 29-year-old. So we grew up and on the same corners together doing the craziest things you could think of. But at the end of that, I'm 30 years old now, and life took me on a different path. And I've done a lot of successful things in my life, and I'm here to speak on all those things now. And, to be, and I'm probably the only guy from Fifth Street, so you know me, he knows me. He knows me, I'm probably the only guy from Fifth Street here that's concerned or has been concerned about this before there was any shooting. And you know we've met in the past before any type of shootings, before anybody died, about my concern of the youth of not just Fifth Street, but Fall River entirely. I've met with you, Mike, uh, about the same concerns I had. And we've talked about it. Everybody speaks about like on sports, but not everybody plays sports. We can't just keep saying basketball leagues, soccer leagues, these leagues like that, because not everyone plays sports. I grew up in Fall River. Fifth Street used to be a basketball community. We used to do a lot of other things, but basketball was the first thing. We used to play ball right at this park. It was a big thing. We was a, one of the most competitive basketball players in Fall River. I have a friend. We both tried out for the team. I didn't make the team, he made the team, and the reason why the coach said we're from Fifth Street, they're bad kids. So I got cut from the team, you remember that. Joey all had a conversation, got my friend back on the team, and he was given a chance. I wasn't. So he's the one who passed away from overdose, but I'm here. And if Art didn't save my life, then I don't know where I would've turned. Sergeant Boomer knows I've been involved with music and all this other stuff. I've toured nationally, being a creative director for some of the top artists in the music industry. So I, I really want to give these kids somewhere they can go, that, that they can express other talents and have the ability to, to create these talents that they might not even know they have. There's a lot of kids that pick up a basketball because that's available. There's a hoop right there, and my basketball is cheap. But the things that I do ain't cheap. The things that I had to grow up to gain for myself, I've never got funded by anybody, never got helped by anybody whatsoever. I own so, so much things that helped me become who I am, but I had to grind and fight for that. And no one helped me. So when there's people here sitting in this room saying that they've been tapped in to Fifth Street and the kids, and the community, I've been here, I moved from Brockton when I was 14, and I'm 30. No one helped nobody there, and I know that. You know, I urge you to there, go to the neighborhood meeting on the first Monday of the month, because there are plans every month to do something for this community. But there's only so much we can do with only a little bit of volunteers. It's, it's not more so volunteers. It's, is I've been in Zoom meetings a lot for the last couple of months, and, and people always have this, this question, it's like, well, we have all these programs and stuff, but how do we get these kids to come to them? Well, you can create all these programs all you want, but if, you don't, if you're not there in the community, if you're not walking the strip and talking to these people, you're not gonna get them here. If, if you don't reach them at a mental level, they're not <coughs> coming. So you can create all these programs all you want, it's not, it's not gonna happen, you know? There's, there's certain people that can reach certain people through basketball. Somebody like Bobby and Joe Cruz has been there for years. So it's easy to get kids to pick up a basketball and sports and put forward with Falcons. These kids look up to these other guys that has gone to college to play and all these other things. So it's easy to get them involved in sports. Well, I've gone to the big leagues and what I do. And there's, there's nobody here to help me give them what they need. 
as far as kids um, pursuing arts and culture and, 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 and music, just giving them another sense of, you know, uh, direction. direction, exactly. And just give, having the resources available where these kids can, can do other things than just play sports. Sport, not everyone goes to the MLB or the NBA or, or, or just wants to play football. So I want to be able to, to provide these, these, um, these services for these young kids where they can be able to learn what I do and how I impact the world in, in, in my way. And I just came from a meeting with the, with, at the Merrill's building with Charlie Merrill, and we're talking about doing creative direction for his new knitting, Barber Knitting Company that he just, just acquired. And that's me from Fifth Street. So I want other kids to know that you can be in meeting rooms and talk to these millionaires or or whoever, and we're, we're able to be in those same rooms with you guys, regardless of where we came from. Because there is hope and there is other things that you can do in this life other than just sports. And I love sports, so I'm, I'm with the basketball leagues, I'm with all that too, but there has to be something else too. And, I, and I've met with Paul Coogan and Mike Dion about this, and just that no one, no one seems to know where to find the, the resources or the sort, I mean the funding, but I know that it needs to happen. And I've expressed these concerns years ago, and now it's a problem. You guys willing to work in a focus group with us? I know Bobby has to because he works for me. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you too? You guys, Bobby, you, Sean, you willing to get together and work? We'll find the funding. If, if it's going to make a change in the city to bring hope to the city, yeah. Then we're willing to put in the work. Good. Because it's got to be that that, okay. that that space of or that right of reason is let these kids know that there is possibility outside of sports like this individual was saying. So yeah, that would be something I'd be interested. All right. Let's try this young lady in the back one question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm with the Neighborhood Association too. As Mark mentioned, we've had a youth program every Wednesday night for the past what six, seven years. I guarantee you guys, if you show up with this focus group, we will bring you the kids. Absolutely. Our program is tailored a little bit more to younger kids. Or to, I mean, there's no age, but usually they get to about, what, Vanessa, 11, 12. You know, they're a little too cool for our stories and our crafts and stuff, so they start to drift away. Those are the kids we need to get. We have them. They're here. They do show up, but then we have nothing for the older kids. So you guys all here. Please, make a commitment. These guys, especially the boys, girls too, but especially the boys, there aren't enough men and in the neighborhood, really, in our neighborhood association, our group. They need mentors. They need direction. They need to know how to apply to college, what to do, what opportunities are out there. So please, if somebody would put something together, I'd be happy to join in and just give some you know, insight into what we've seen and the kids in the neighborhood. And thank you all so much for showing right, guys, up. There's a great need. Thank okay, you. I appreciate that. Yeah. We've touched a lot of topics tonight. Uh, these gentlemen here that work for the city or Christian, if you want to grab somebody on the way out, like Joe said, and express your concerns, do it. I can't thank everybody enough uh, for coming out tonight. Um, our city councilors, our department heads, the Florida Police Department, the FBI's here. These are people that are concerned about this. We have, as this gentleman called out, we have to get these programs going now instead of yesterday. So, again, we will move on this as fast as we can <coughs> for the summer. But, again, thank you very, very much. Can I just say something before we leave? I have talked to the mayor about a lot of different things because I'm committed to doing stuff with you. One of the things I wanted to do was come out and celebrate the diversity, have every ethnic group in the community go down to the park, have music, um, express themselves, have samples of food, so we get to know everybody and we're not afraid of different cultural groups. The other thing we tried to do was, I went to three of the schools, two of the high schools I couldn't get to because of COVID, but what do kids want to do? I had one little girl at the Agassiz School, I was telling Sean about it, who said, I'd like to have a dance on the battleship. I live in Heritage Heights, I see the battleship every day, but my mom and dad work and they don't make a lot of money and I have two brothers and they can't afford for the five of us to go on to the battleship. So there's things like that that we can do. The mayor and I have been working on a picnic ground for 
the, the city with John Perry, with Mike Dion, uh, a bunch of other people. Thursday, they're going to rake that all out. We have a pathway. We're putting uh, granite benches. We're putting picnic tables. And one of the things we'd like to do, we got somebody to give us electricity, have something there where kids can come on a Thursday night. The thing is, you need the chaperones. And Sean just said he chaperone. So, um, you know, Bobby will come. But get the kids out there. Get the kids out there to do things. So the mayor and I are working on that because we realized that it wasn't. Thank you for all the help you've given me. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Can't thank you enough for coming out tonight. I know it's a hot night, but spending time with us is really, really important. We had to hear what you had to say, and what you said was more important probably than what any of us said. So again, thanks everybody for coming.